Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Pasco School Board for our study session this afternoon. We're going to discuss use of district facilities and how that, that works into our current policies and, and how we can work as a board and as a district to um, edit and improve those policies. So we have Ms. Michelle Whitney here. Thank you. So Sarah and I, um, my part of tonight's presentation is really just to set the context for what Sarah is about to present to you. And I just wanted to express to you as a board, Sarah and I are really excited about, and maybe even just kind of strangely excited about how awesome this is going to be. Um, because one of the things I just think is really, um, as an organizational leader, watching things start to really come together around the work over the last seven months, and how that initial work of the board governance model, the outrageous outcomes, our budget planning process, how that is really starting to overlap and align with really all of the key functions of the district for me as an organizational leader is really exciting and when we think about and talk about what we started with was with that quadrant graphic with service in the middle and that we were going to focus on being proactive efficient consistent etc um, this really aligns with that and so for me it's really exciting to see what the the work of the last seven months and watch it unfold and really start to fit together in what has been a genuine and authentic way um, is exciting and and you know Sarah and I got kind of moved by the spirit over this policy update process so what she's gonna show you tonight and I think what you have experienced in the past which is a legitimate way to update process and we will still utilize this the mechanism that we've used in the past for some purposes what she's going to show you tonight is a way that we're going to take that to a deeper level in a way that aligns with your desires as a board and what you've expressed as important to you through your board governance model. Um, and Sarah's got a nice presentation that lays out and connects those dots across the system. I want to thank Sarah for her efforts in really helping me shape and think about this differently um, in, in what I think is a very innovative approach that I haven't seen other districts using. So I want to acknowledge Sarah's efforts on that um, and really taking a risk and um, kind of like I bring these strange ideas to the table and say, hey, how can we make this stuff work? And district staff has been just really phenomenal in helping me think outside the box and connecting dots. So with that, I'll let Sarah start to walk us through what this will look like. So I guess where I'd like to start is with it, kind of at the beginning and, and reference back to the work that you have done in developing your coherent governance structure um, and the work that you've done in, in through the book, uh, Good Governance is a Choice. Um, when Michelle suggested that we look at the policies with a new approach, um, initially, <laughs> my my it, it's just my nature and my training I think sometimes my initial reaction is mm, no, no um, which is not where we where we want to go with things um, but what really helped connect the dots for me was when I read chapter 10 in the good governance is a choice book which is focused on the systemic application and the alignment of the model to the functions in the district because I think for those of us who who were Work um, within the system, not at the not at the the board level. Th there, there's there really is a desire to to make those connections to to bring the the work of the board and the policies that you're developing and that you've developed around this governance model and 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 bring that into the organization so that it does drive the work. And so that's that's really that alignment of of you know what you want those outcomes to be and the work that we're doing every day that's what this process we hope um, helps achieve um, in a real real in a real in a very real way um, for the for the staff who are doing it so it's a it's something new it's an experiment and I I'll just start off by saying we look forward to your feedback as we're working through this um, this process because it is something it's it's a new idea for a way for us to work 
Um, but but as a board, you know, you've engaged in a process where you um, you're you're ensuring that you are the proxy decision makers for the community, and that you are through your work and the policies that you've developed as a board here that you. Um, are capturing the the values and the priorities of, of the community and 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 that's the real connection piece for for the work that I do around the policies the board policies at the governance level need to be reflected and reinforced in the district level policies that we rely on every day especially for those policies that are connected to or related to the uh, the major initiatives the important initiatives that that we're embarking on this year so so that's really what what this is about um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just differentiating to make sure that we all understand the what it is specifically that we're talking about and kind of the difference between the the board governance model policies the district policies procedures and and what the what that process is uh, is going to look like because the as you know the district policies that are in the policy manual are not the same as the the board policies or the governance model um, that you've uh, that you've developed um, the you know, you're, you're obviously you're familiar with your own, you know, the work that you've done around the governance policies. I know I'm not supposed to step away from the microphone to do this. Um, where you have worked on governance policies, your CEO relationship policies, your results policies um, that are uh, are captured in the in the outrageous outcomes. These are the ways in which you have um, created a framework and a structure for, for the overall work of the organization. Underneath that are the district level policies, which are those that are in the policy manual. Um, the 1000 series, which is related to the board's work, the 2000. So, so these are the, the district policies where we bring you those policy updates at first reading, occasionally have a discussion more often than not I'm presenting a recommendation. There aren't really a lot of questions. There's not a lot of public input into that process. And then the policy change is implemented on second reading on the consent agenda. That's, that's typically how our process for policy revision has gone. And then on the, uh, and then related to that, no, I do not I want to close all tabs. There we go. On the, um, and then the procedures related to those district policies are where we um, talk about the where, where we develop those operational details uh, the, for 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 day to day guidelines that help us carry out the work. Um, so so what we're talking about um, working on here is how we can connect the district policies to those board policies. Really um, codify, if you will, the, the governance model policies that you're developing and that you've developed, and at the same time, refresh the way that we, um, that we look at the, the overall district policies. Now this is a, um, this is a graphic that I borrowed from chapter 10 of Good Governance is a Choice, and I really like it because it, it demonstrates for me kind of who is doing what work at what point in the organization and, and how the policy direction that comes from the board and that comes from the district policies translates throughout the organization to, to drive the results back to the community. Um, the, the work that you do as a board is around the governance team, where you've developed, up at the top, where you've developed and are developing your, your governance model policies, and you work with the superintendent on doing that. Well, then the, the strategy team would be the superintendent, the administrative team, sometimes the direct supervisors, um, works on the, the how implementation of, of your policy, of, of the board level policies. Um, that then gets translated into specific uh, procedures 
for um, line staff, operational staff, and who, who, who do the boots on the ground work, and, and that drives the results. So there, there should be connection throughout the organization um, between all of those levels. And as it's structured right now, um, we don't have that connection. Um, the, the work is new, and so the goal of this particular process would be to create those connections um, and, and bring that work all together. This is another way to look at what, the what we're proposing that the actual policy structure look like. Um, right now, you as a board have adopted uh, some of your governance policies, the operational expectations, but those at this point are not codified anywhere in the policy manual. Um, one change that we're proposing is that as you develop those policies and approve them as a board, those would actually be incorporated into the district pol policy manual as a statement of philosophy um, and, and providing the overall scope of framework for you as a board for the district policies to, to help um, remind us and, and create an expectation that the work of the district should be related to those, those broad goals and expectations that, that you've set as a board. In the current uh, district policy manual, this was um, adopted based on the WASDA model, which uh, came out back in the early 1990s, sometime between 1992 and 1996. And the way that they structured it within that, that manual is every chapter has room for an overall kind of policy um, or philo philosophy kind of statement at the beginning of each policy manual, usually in the in the you know the 1,000 or the 2,000 or the 3,000 policy, and that's where we'd propose where they fit, putting um, first of all putting your your board policies, um, and so I will be working uh, with Michelle on how and, and and you know Scott on how we might do that so so that that work is is incorporated into the overall structure. Um, the district policies then should be aligned with those and consistent with those, and, and, and that's the rest of the policy manual, and then of course the, the procedures. And again, that whole structure should be designed to, um, to, to drive the results back up to, um, back up to the community. This is just a simple graphic trying to reflect our current revision and adoption process. And like I just described, it's, it's really more of a reactive process. And like Michelle said at the beginning, um, the plan is not to bring every single policy to you for this deep study and analysis. It would be um, an overwhelming um, we'd never get anything done. It would be an overwhelming, time-consuming task. There are simply some policies that we have to have in place for compliance purposes. Um, it, it just is what it is. Um, and, and our plan where we need to update those policies would be to continue to bring those in the, in, in the same manner. Um, where we want to make a change, though, is with policies that are connected to the, um, the, the broader initiatives of the, of the district and broader initiatives of the board. So the example we're going to talk about tonight and the first one we'd like to get out of the gate is the facilities use policy, and that's connected to the district's initiative around uh, long-term facilities planning and the work of the community builders group um, and I'll and I'll talk about that specifically in just a minute but that's something where there's a real opportunity for the board to go through a process where you can study the policy in some detail gather some information get input from stakeholders um, really have some some robust thinking around what is it that is most important for the community what is it that should be what should the district priorities be how should that be reflected in the policy um, and before we get to a you know recommended language or final review there's been a lot of opportunity prior to that for for input and study and discussion
What that would look like, and, and this is, you know, really there's there's flexibility here, and, and I would be looking for your input on how you, if you think that this will work, if you've got some suggestions for how we might uh, potentially tweak this process. But the idea is that we would bring a proposed topic to you for discussion and like I said it would be related to one of the uh, one of the big initiatives or the uh, the um, governance model you know, related to the board's work um, we would bring you the current policy language um, additional information find out from you what other data and information you would want um, and how we would want to gather stakeholder input we would get that information back to you for further discussion. You'd have an opportunity to determine, do we need more information? Um, and then eventually that process would result in uh, direction to me and to staff on how we want to, or how you want to modify current policies, what, what are going to be the, the most important key points to capture, then we'd bring a draft back for you, get clarification, and eventually have something that reflects your work and, and where, you have, um, ha where you have consensus over what the, the direction should be, and then we would bring that back to, to the board, uh, regular board meeting for, for adoption. So before I start delving into the facilities policy any thoughts or questions does that make sense does it not make sense do we like it do we hate it oh I think I think this is a great idea because you know I especially when I've gone over and talked to senators and representatives sometimes they make really stupid decisions with really great intentions and I think that we are capable of doing or probably have done the same made really stupid decisions with great intentions because we don't understand the ramifications of the policies that we are implementing so I feel it's really important to get that input not at, at like you said not on everything I mean you know there's a policy right now um, about how many credits kids need to graduate uh, we're not going to get input on that. That's not, you know, that's the state's directive. It's not the community's directive. Um, we, we don't get to decide that. But on things that do affect the community, I think that this is a great way, and, and not just the community, but the, our teachers and our staff. I think this is a great way to get input and, and so that we better understand um, what we're doing. So I think this is fantastic. I love this idea. I'm, like I said, not in all policies, but in the ones that, that affect our communities and staff. So I, I'm really excited about this. I like the wheel or the, the continuous wheel we have there. I, th I think we're saying we can come in anywhere on that wheel to initiate this process. Sometime it, it might start over at the input. We get input from the community and it starts this process or Sometime it may come from a director who, who has an idea and we start down at the direction area or it might come out of a study session, start up at the study study area. So I think I like that continuous wheel and we can have continuous improvement until we get to the point where we have a draft that we're ready to uh, bring to first reading. Yeah, and, and you really have complete control as a board over, you know, how, how how this process works you know you get as much information uh, as you need or want and sometimes it might be a lot and this might take a long time sometimes it might not be and it, and it might be a, a faster cycle but there's no um, you know typically a policy that we're going to bring through this process should not be time sensitive um, you you really should be able to take the time you need to um, to, to to think about it and do the work on it Okay. So our guinea pig policy is the use of school facilities policy. Um, you do have uh, some things in your folder, and I'm going to talk talk you through the the policy itself in just a minute. Um, but for for reference, you have the a copy of the current policy. 
you've got the WASDA model policy, and then we did pull a couple policies from our neighboring districts. Just to give you an idea of, of what some of the variation is that is uh, that's out there. Um, this policy, and I think I mentioned earlier, we're choosing to focus on because it does relate to the work that we're doing through the community builders uh, group and through the long-term facilities planning consultant. And what came out of some of the preliminary work that that group did and that our consultant heard from various members of the community that that he talked about was that there um, there's there's feet there's been feedback given to to you as board members and also to to us uh, as administrators that um, this is a policy that needs updating um, really to better reflect the both the board's philosophy and direction to to help better meet the community needs um, around facilities that really are um, you know they're, they're taxpayer funded community assets and so um, we it would be helpful for the community to for the district to um, to to revisit this policy and uh, make sure that it that it reflects the interests and priorities um, that are appropriate as determined by the board. So, so this will be a great opportunity for us to try out the, to, to try out the wheel, if you will, and and uh, and see how it goes. Um, this is also a policy, although the procedures have been updated over time, um, and that's the detail of how that policy is applied. Um, the actual policy language itself has not been updated since say 1996 so it's been um, it, it's been a, a, a very long time it, it was at the time based on was the model policy language um, and you know whether or not there was work done to make it more specific to the needs of our community I don't know uh, but um, but it, it was part of that adoption of, of the was policies back in the day some of the reasons that we've heard to bring this forward um, were identified um, both by the consultant and through the community um, builders group. Um, it, different members of the community, and, and when I say community, I don't just mean our patrons and our community groups, I mean our staff as well. The, the, the facilities policy really touches a very, very broad spectrum of, of people. Um, we have our um, extracurricular activities, our athletic activities, all have to um, be able to use our school facilities and then we also have outside various outside groups lots of outside groups who want to be able to use our school facilities as well and 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 what we're hearing from um, all of those groups is that they're requesting some clarification around priorities what are the district's priorities for use of school or district facilities um, some people feel that the administration of the different fees has been inconsistent um, or that it's not clear necessarily from the language who should be charged what fee for what purpose um, there may be consistency between different facilities or inconsistency between between different facilities as far as who's allowed to use what when um, and that's been a concern for some people um, that there have been um, there there are some restraints on the district to be able to support different community activities um, and then it's generally just not efficient um, you know we've also heard concerns from um, our buildings and administrators that you know sometimes um, not everyone who uses the district facilities is 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for conscientious about taking care of the space and there have been incidents where um, you know there's been damage or or it becomes very problematic for the district to be able to clean up after different users things like that so a variety of reasons kind of across the spectrum um, why we heard what we heard from the community to to bring this particular policy forward I'd like to add one there just because I think several board members may have heard this from other from multiple patrons just so they know that we're talking about it that some patrons follow what they think is the process and then they don't they're not even clear if they have access to that and they may be 
They may show up and get kicked out by staff. They may show up and get kicked mm -hmm. out by another user who also thinks that they have used it. So just clarifying that portion of it too, I think is uh, something we've heard of. say a certain piece the um, the first part I think of the study of the existing policy will be focusing on that what the current language says about the 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 district philosophy and you're going to hear me as we go through this process um, and in the future you're going to hear me refer a lot to kind of the philosophy and the broader term because what I'm going to click back here for a second what we're doing in this work is is looking at the the really the box in the middle what are the, the general principles that the board wants to take from, from the community, from your constituents, and apply in this policy. What are the general standards of conduct that you want to be included in the policy? The purpose is not to um, talk about um, operational details or, or get into the nitty gritty of how that policy is administered. It's really to be setting the, the general expectations around what the board's expectation and philosophy is for staff to be able to administer the policy. So if you look in your folder, um, there is a document with yellow highlights, and that is the existing policy. And I put those highlights around some of the, the language statements in there that I thought were examples of what I mean by what the philosophy is, what the kind of the overarching goal of the policy is. Um, so, so you'll see statements where the board is encouraging public use of the facilities, where the board considers the facility to be part of, com of the community. Those are some of those overarching statements um, that the outside use of district facilities shouldn't interfere with district use of facilities. That's, that's a kind of a standard of conduct or an expectation around what that might look like. You also see some language around different types, how, how the, the, the groups have been divided into three different tiers, if you will, um, group one, group two, and group three. And really what that language serves to do is it differentiates and prioritizes um, who is charged and who is not charged for use of district facilities. Um, so again, that is a statement of philosophy from the board who has made a value judgment that community betterment groups, gr groups who are working in the interest of children or, or activities for children are charged the least amount all the way down to the other end of the spectrum where uh, commercial groups are charged the highest fee and really the, the preferences that commercial groups not utilize the district facilities or rent the district facilities. Um, those aren't necessarily all of the, the, the philosophy statements in that policy. It's a pretty short, actually a pretty short policy, but just to illustrate for you what I'm talking about when, when I'm using that language. Now, this is not intended to drive the outcome at all of this process. What I what I'm, would like to do though here is just talk about what, to, to give you kind of a complete picture of where this might go, what some of the potential outcomes are, would be, or how you might see this in the language. So based on the, the input or the concerns that we're getting. So if there is a policy statement for example, that says this is part of the district facilities or part of the community, maybe the board feels like that's something that needs to be beefed up, that, that the district needs to make a stronger statement about um, what the, the district facilities or school facilities are, that these are quote unquote community resources or assets. Um, or the board may decide, no, that captures it, we're good, we don't need to change the language. Um, so words around encouraging public 
use. You might decide to leave those where they are. You might decide to make changes there. Um, one item that you probably won't make a lot of changes on is the, uh, the, the, the issue around interference with district use, that the, the facilities need to be first available for district purposes and district use. Um, you'll see that pretty consistency in, in other policies. Um, if you're getting feedback from the community that there, there needs to be clarification, one option might be to simplify classifications of users. And so what we'd see at the result of the, of the wheel is a process where you would be able to provide, after you get the input, have discussion, um, reach some consensus on what the priorities are for the board, we would then align that with where we may need to make changes in the language and bring that back to you as a draft. And then you would have an opportunity to say, yeah, that captures it, no, that doesn't capture it, we need to um, put more emphasis here, we need to take this out, et cetera. Um, and then we would, you know, again, take another stab at a draft and, and bring that back to you. The you know, like I said at the beginning, the purpose of this is to try to align the work that you've done with the policy work and, and, and bring that into the organization in a real meaningful way. Um, bring the community voice into those policies, especially those that are, that are impacted by the, um, by the big initiatives. Um, you know, Amy, you mentioned the graduation policy and you're absolutely, I, I think that example is, 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 a, is a great example, a great point, because tonight we're gonna do first reading on the gra state graduation requirements which we have no control over. We have to make that change to the policy. What we're not bringing to you is any of the other language that is contained in that policy, but that very well could come forward after either the legislature is done with whatever they're doing over in Olympia or after the career and college ready group gets done with the work that they're doing around the high school program. That might be a perfect opportunity then, and I'm sure that they're going to have some input as to what they would like to see changed in the policy. So th that's a great example where we're gonna bring that graduation policy tonight and you know, that's, it, it, it is what it is. Um, the, there are a couple non-purposes for, for this work. Um, the, the purpose of this work is not to politicize the district's policy process. Um, yes, we, we very much want to reflect the, um, what the priorities are for the community, but this is not uh, in any way intended to um, upend certain uh, you know, legal protections or, or things that we have in place that are required by law that are captured in policy. Uh, because again, that those are legal requirements and, and that's what we have to do as a, as a government organization. Um, it's all, the, the, another non-purpose is, again, to get into those nitty-gritty administrative details. We want to continually try to focus on, keeping, on uh, keeping, keeping our focus at a high level. Any questions up to to this point? Okay. So here we are. <laughs> that's what we'd like to do, um, and and hopefully that is a process that's going to meet your needs. Um, as we move forward with the facilities policy, um, I'm curious to hear what, as you're thinking about this issue and, and, and what you personally as a board member have heard, um, what other information and data um, do you want to have as we, as we go through this? You know, I'm a little concerned about getting the people who of interest in this policy here. I mean, I think it's critical to get principals here. I think it's critical that we get um, that we get the people who are trying to use maybe, you know, some of the community organizations here to mm -hmm. know what they would, you know, what they want. And 
and what they need as well as um, you know parents and and anyway ba basically the community that's going to use the facilities outside of of um, school hours and we, we know how it's going to impact the schools so I think that's the hard part is getting the people here that can give us a good idea of what they need so that we can build policies around around that mm -hmm. we do have access to the contact information for uh, individuals and groups who've used our, our um, facilities in the past so I think one of the simplest uh, things would be to uh, send a communication, whether it's an email or, or a letter, out to those individuals, make contact with them and let them know that this is a subject that the board is going to be working on um, and, and reach out to them to make sure that they're, if they're interested in it, that they can be engaged. Um, and that would include district, um, like the building administrators, the ADs, um, Maybe even coaches. the custodians because mm -hmm. they might be really yeah. impacted by this. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Do we, do we have a current definition for, I saw up there, community partners? Mm -hmm. Like I, I would assume that it includes like the city, we're sharing, you know, um, we're sharing play fields and, and stuff like that. I would assume it includes city parks and rec, but mm -hmm. is, there, is there a list where we have defined community partners anywhere? There isn't a formal list of quote unquote community partners. We have a variety of different kinds of agreements um, that involve use of facilities. So, so the city and Parks and Rec is one, um, both with the schools that share property with a park, um, like Maya Angelo or McGee. Um, they, we have a number of sites where we work with the city to, to mutually use that space. Um, and then we also have an agreement with Parks and Rec around priority for being able to, to, to use district facilities. Boys and Girls Club is another um, organization um, that uses uh, our facilities for uh, before and after school care programs uh, and summer programs. Um, so, so generally speaking, Scott, when we're talking about community partners, it, it is organizations that we have some kind of formalized relationship with um, Tri-Cities Community Health for example you know they've got the the uh, clinic on the Ochoa site would be another um, but we don't have a you know specific definition do we get very much of the commercial that comes in and has classes and whatever do we get that last category that's on here very much in our facilities I don't know. Commercial and that's, enterprises. I'm gonna, a lot of these questions I think you're gonna have, I'm not going to know the answer to, and that's part of the information that we can bring back with to you um, when we go further down the road. So thank you for the presentation. Just a couple thoughts. I haven't reviewed all the material that we just re received here, but uh, as you mentioned, I think this is timely. We've talked a lot about increasing our early learning opportunities and kind of struggled as other areas in our state and country to kind of how do we address that and uh, expanding ECAP was an option or preschool opportunities but those tend to meet during the day which is when our obviously K-12 students meet so that's a challenge for any area that uh, facilities are tight which is many areas so um, it seems like a great solution to, to use those facilities obviously and in the afternoons or evenings when school's not in session. Uh, we have early release days or school even just in general gets out before five or six. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an, an add on late evening weekend, but these are times when people are still at this school and it should be easy to accommodate. So I, I'm excited about the opportunity to expand the parent education resources that we provide. I know that's very successful and I visited some of their facilities and there's always a waiting list. I know I said that many times. So we just, if we can open up more, more of the facilities for that. And obviously we've talked about the ready for kindergarten and this is a perfect opportunity where we just have facilities that we can use at times when our K-12 students are not in school and there's plenty of times to do that. Um, another kind of general idea or principle that I think this will apply to most of these policies and not just this one is uh, something you mentioned about kind of the consistency and, 
and communication or understanding of the policy like okay I, I have no idea how like let's say I have a scout group and I want to use the school near my, where I live I mean I have no idea who do I contact how is the process what would the cost be and and I think the challenge that we have with this and in lots of other areas is consistent input because this is a frustration we often hear from school to school and from the district but what is the uh, the procedure or protocol and uh, does the person that's the receptionist know and say the right thing? Do they get sent to the right person? And this is kind of a big picture. Uh, I think that's something that we can improve that's been a, a struggle in the last couple of years, as it is with any large organization. So, yeah. so that's the other principle I think that will be uh, exciting to kind of help in lots of areas. Um, and then the last thing as far as facilities, I think this is helpful is um, we have struggles in our community, but not just our community, with the health of children, uh, struggles with um, activity levels and uh, exercise and things like that. So the, I've wondered myself, like, what are our, our facilities open for use of the playground space? What are the times or rules? And a good comparison would be like, say, McGee to Franklin and schools where the site is set up differently. Some schools are somewhat blocked off, Franklin may be locked. Whereas McGee's an older school and it's very easy to access. What, you know, I don't know our liabilities there, but McGee, I know people tend to just go and use that, that space, and, and we did as well. Uh, and it's different at some of our other schools. So what are kind of the procedures and policies, and do our, does our community know that? Uh, I, mean, I don't even know what is, what's available. So tying some of those things together, I think, will be helpful and appreciated by the community, and maybe we'll provide lots of benefit to our, our community. I think I, I discussed this with Michelle just the other day, um, and it ties in here too, but even just the community knowing expectations on when their school building is open. You know, some, some schools might, the first bell rings at nine o'clock for an elementary school, let's say. Some parents can go show up at 8.30 and, and go talk to their teachers, take care of business there if they need to. Other schools, you might show up at 8.50 or 8.55 and, and the school's still locked. Um, just even tying that in, not for extracurricular things or extra groups, but just expectations of the, of the facilities consistent across, across the board, I think, is another positive thing that could come out of this. That could be listed on the website with school hours, and I think it is in some of our schools. Well, and that particular concern, um, Carla Lobos is meeting with the principals. I believe, that I think she may have already met with them. The principals were also asking for the, from clarity and expectation. So I'll, I expect to have that even outside of, yes, yeah, yeah. That, that loop is getting closed as we speak. Are they having problems with like people dropping off their kids a half an hour before school? I don't know that. I just know that there was a request for <laughs> <laughs> principals like yeah. <laughs> uh, I I just know that there was a request for some consistency and guidance around if I'm a school whose start time is X, you know, when does the door open, et cetera, so that and the principals were asking for that. We want to be clear and consistent across the district and so they're working on and that. And it needs to be it really does need to be re readily available, you know, right on the websites of those schools and yep. Yeah. Once it's decided, we'll do a media campaign and get it published and so that people are clear. Yeah, that's a great point. I know it's been an for my kids because they love like the recess before school and I'm like, is that a thing? Like, I don't know, when does Ms. Holmberg want these kids out of the school? I mean, they probably don't appreciate that, but I don't even know. I mean, I, you know, are they, and then some kids have, lunch, have breakfast in the school and, and so I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure our principals have a much better grasp than we do, but I, I don't know, you know, when is it preferred or allowed for the kids to be there playing outside? Because they love that time. They want to leave early so that they can get to school and see friends before school starts. But having the consistency across the district, like you mentioned, I'm sure the principals appreciate too. And school starts so late in our elementary schools. And that's, yeah, that's tough. Another, so, so a couple of next steps for this particular process. Um, what we'd like to do next is um, at, at the next meeting in which we talk about this policy, that's the meeting where um, we'd like for you to have an opportunity to get input from stakeholders. And, and I think we would do that in a couple different ways. Michelle and I talked today about developing a survey that could be widely available uh, and making those results, survey results available to you. Um, and then also making sure that we publicize and 
um, th that opportunity to, to give the board input and also, um, like I said, make contact with, with people who've utilized the facilities before um, to, to make sure that, or, or, or who have an interest, I should say, not just people who've used the facilities before, anyone, including um, district staff and administrators who, who um, have an interest in making sure that this is a, is, is a good process. Um, and that these, um, you know, these are public assets, and I think everyone wants, recognizes that, and and really wants them to be put to the best use possible. Um, so reaching out to anyone who who's got an interest in that, um, letting them know that they can can come provide input to the board, um, would be the next steps. Other than that, um, any other input or thoughts on the the proposed process? Um, we are kind of building the plane as we're flying it with this one, and so we may just need to to tweak how it's working as we're doing it. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm hopeful, and I'm looking forward to it. So. What? When, when would be an approximate timeline that would give district staff enough time to get ready for this next meeting, but also make contacts with, with interested parties um, to come in and have this first session? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and without having, so, so we've got to be mindful of having enough time to be able to do that, but also of what the board calendar is with what you have coming up. And Scott, I just don't have that in front of me. So, so we can we can clarify at agenda setting okay. so we have some options and study sessions coming up right. um, and I just need to know from you in terms of moving things around priorities but we can make it a priority for May all right we'll, we'll work on that okay. with, the, with the schedule and look forward to hearing more from you yeah. thank you yeah. thank you miss Whitney thank, thank you, you. miss Thornton any other questions from the board all right, we'll adjourn the study session for this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing those who remain at our regularly scheduled meeting at 6.30.